It is my uh, pleasure and privilege to continue our study today of uh, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in particular, and some of the related books as we look at rebuilding. Uh, this morning, um, I'm going to continue from where uh, Nino left off on Wednesday, and I'll take us to, well, from just by way of recap, the end of Ezra chapter 4 into Ezra chapter 5, and then we'll jump into a book of the Bible that if you are scrolling, turning your pages too quickly, you may go past it. It's such a short book in the Old Testament. We'll get to it shortly, but please bow your heads with me as we pray. Our great Father in heaven, we come to you at this time acknowledging your holiness, your majesty, your glory. Father, we want to honor you with our lives. We want to honor you with the meditations of our hearts. And so we pray that today you would be with us. Fill us with your spirit and pour us with uh, just a sense of humility and awe as we think about your glory. Father, please be with me today that I may be your instrument. Help me to communicate clearly, powerfully, and with humility. Help our Bible study to enrich us all and to draw us ever so closer to you, that you may be honored and you may be pleased. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So I'm going to take us to a slide presentation to take us through our lesson this morning. And uh, it's entitled, God's Honor and Pleasure. Lessons from the book of Haggai. Yes, that's one of those minor prophets way to the end of your Old Testament. Only two chapters long. Like I said earlier, if you're turning your Bible too quickly, you may jump from the two books beginning with C, <laughs> Zephaniah and Zechariah, and go straight past Haggai. It's such a short book. And notwithstanding its brevity, there's so much power packed in it. I want to take us to the end of Ezra chapter 4. And if you are joining this series for the very first time, we have been, well, in the broader context of 2020, the church has been focused on the theme All In. And what we've been doing for the last six weeks or so is a study of the return of the exiles, God's people who were in exile in Babylon, coming back to Jerusalem for the purposes of rebuilding the temple which was destroyed, as well as the walls. Uh, the walls being rebuilt, we would see, um, really done under the, the, the leadership of Nehemiah. Um, Ezra is one of a wave of three waves of exiles returning to Jerusalem. And so uh, on Wednesday, Gone and Nino would have um, shown us yet another time as the foundation um, was to be laid, the foundation for first for the altar, and then the foundation for the temple was laid in chapter 3. And not for the first time, opposition came. And one form of opposition came directly from King Artaxerxes as he read a letter and gave a decree. So by way of quick recap, at the end of chapter 4 of Ezra in verse 23, feel free to follow on your screen or in your Bibles with you. As soon as the copy of the King of Artaxerxes, copy of the letter of King Artaxerxes was read to Rehum and Shimshai, the secretary and their associates, they went immediately to the Jews in Jerusalem and compelled them by force to stop, all right? So the effort to continue rebuilding the temple after the foundation was laid, here's a letter from the king that says stop. In verse 24, it says, thus, the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. You knew what I've mentioned to us Wednesday, this standstill actually lasted for 16 years. Imagine you were doing a building project right now. It's 2020. And opposition comes, you get discouraged, and you just stop what you're doing, and you don't resume until 2036. 16 years. Nothing is happening for the purposes of the rebuilding of God's temple. And I want to be able to place in context God's temple and the presence of God's temple is important at least for two reasons. Number one, the temple symbolized the presence of God. And so no temple really was signifying when we, we don't really have the, the confirmation of God's presence with us. The second significance of the temple was this was the place for sacrifices to God, the opportunity to make atonement for sin. The absence of a temple really removes that avenue for the forgiveness of sin. 
no temple is a serious time in Israel's history. No presence of God, no forgiveness of sin, all right, through this, the temple sacrifices. And so I want for us to be able to understand that the lack of temple being there really was of major significance from a spiritual perspective. Follow with me as we move to Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Brothers and sisters and friends, I am stopping at Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 for you to understand that after this, the, the standstill, the work on the temple had stopped, God intervened using the voices of two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. If you've never read Haggai and Zechariah before, now is a good time to do it during the course of the week. Because you now get some context as to why these two Old Testament books, all right, why they're there. The timing of the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah was during the, the, the period when the temple was stopped in terms of its rebuilding. So exactly what did Haggai have to say? This is where I want to take us this morning. Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, you eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Brothers and sisters and friends, this was the message of Haggai to the people of Israel as they stopped rebuilding the temple. And what Haggai was able to say to them, this is God's messenger. And God says, look, and let me go back to this. He says, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panel houses while this house remains a ruin? So even though they stopped the building due to the discouragement and the opposition, they started to take care of themselves. And here Haggai talks about them living in their panel houses, suggesting maybe a certain level of opulence, a certain level of, of wealth. And so God, through his messenger, says, is this a time? For you to be taking care of yourself when my house remains in ruin? And the challenge is a very piercing one. Not only in verse 5, but also in verse 7. Through Haggai, God says, give careful thought to your ways. And he said, look, look at what you're doing. You are making efforts to advance yourself, but it's failing. You drink, but never have your fill. You planted, but you have harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You put on clothes, you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. It does not last. And God was trying to show them, you know, you, you, you put my agenda aside to take care of yourself. And yet, it's not being blessed. Because no longer... Is my priority your priority? You're taking care of yourself. He says, give careful thought to your ways. Ask us to reflect. Do, is this something that we do regularly? Do we regularly give careful thought to our ways? 
just to make sure I'm with you, could I just get a thumbs up that we're seeing the slides clearly? I've just been assuming everything is fine. Okay, great. Do we regularly give careful thought to our ways? Ask a follow-up question. Was life before COVID so busy and the pace so frenetic that we forgot what it means to have quiet contemplation about how we're living. And I know we, we talk about the treadmill, just the busy schedules, running from one activity to the next, from one meeting to the next, those who are parents from one children's activity to the next, from one class to the next. And our life has become so frenetic and in the midst of all of that, then we have this, this social media and the likes and the dislikes and the friends and the unfriends and all of the various things that crowd our schedule. And what it's done is that it's, it's prevented us so many times from slowing down and reflecting. How am I doing? How, how, how am I living? I, I think this, this, this challenge that he guy gave Give careful thought to your ways. It's, it's something that we have to do. And you know, this is not necessarily us in our time uh, doing badly spiritually. It's just slowing down. Slowing down to evaluate how am I doing? How's my life really going? How are my daily choices? And, and it may very well be that uh, the global population, one of the things that has had to happen through COVID is that we've had to slow down, to give careful thought to our ways. Is God really first in our lives? You know, and for those of us who have made a decision to, to follow Jesus, let's not be tempted to automatically say yes. Because it's, it's really the fruit of our lives that gives an indication before God as to whether or not he thinks that we have placed him first. You know, look at what the next verse says in Haggai 1 and verse 8. Through Haggai, God says this, people go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house. Pay attention to the reason so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. And I want to bring us back to, to why we do what we do and to, for the real purpose of our human existence. We are alive to honor God and to bring pleasure to him. Nothing else. Nothing else. That's the reason for our existence. To honor God and to bring pleasure to him. And so I, I want for us to kind of recalibrate and, and, to, and to look at our lives through the lenses of bringing God pleasure. This is not about Christian activity. This is not about clocking into our service. This is not about giving financially. This is about our lives bringing honor to God. He looks at me and he takes pleasure in the condition of my heart and what I consider to be priority. This is why we exist, for God's honor. Our worship as disciples of Jesus is about bringing God honor. It's not about us looking good. It's not about us showing off our talents. And even our spiritual activity can end up being about us and how we look. And if people are impressed with what we've done, rather than... God is pleased, and what I do brings honor to his name. I want God to look down from heaven and be pleased with the condition of my heart. First and foremost, if our hearts are right, the actions will follow. I'm not asking us this morning to change our behavior. I'm asking us this morning to give careful thought to our hearts. Is God the king of your heart? Is Jesus Lord in the true sense of what lordship means? Because this was the problem 
And one of the problems with the exiles, they missed bringing honor to God. And that was why God says in verse 8, pay attention to this verse. Go up to the mountains, bring back the timber, and build my house. So that, when you see in the Bible, you see those words, so that. Then we're given a reason why the challenge is given. So that I may take pleasure in it. And be honored. What was the response? You fast forward to verse 12 of Haggai chapter 1. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. Isn't this typical of God? You get a rebuke. You get a challenge to repent. But he reminds us and he reassures us, I am with you. I, I care about relationship. God says what matters to me is our relationship, not your activity, but my relationship with you. That is what matters. I want to be with you. I want to be close to you. But that can't happen if you have idols in your heart. If you have an idol in your heart, then there's no place for God to be first. So it's not about our activity this morning. Do we have idols in our hearts that have gotten in the way of God being our first love? We're honoring him is what counts. I do well at work because I want to honor God. I, I study hard for my exams as a student because I want God to take pleasure in my diligence. Not because mommy reminded me or the teacher gave me some tips, but I want to honor God. I raise my children if I'm a parent in a way that pleases God because that is what matters most to me. And yes, I may get help from some spiritual men and women. That's important. But it's all about walking closely with God and pleasing him. See, the response was, was amazing. The people saw that the message came from God. Hey, guy was just the messenger. And it says the whole remnant, they were all in. <laughs> they were all in. The whole remnant obeyed the voice of God. And it says the people feared him. The people feared God. And that came about through preaching. Do not underestimate the power of God's word to change your heart. It may be a Sunday message. It may be a quarantine devotional. It may be a midweek message. It may be your own devotional, your own quiet time, studying the Bible, listening to the Bible on audio. Whatever form the word of God comes in, do not underestimate its power to change your heart and make you bow down before God and revere him. That is what the people responded to. And when we go back to Ezra, in chapter 5, verse 2. So I stopped at verse 1. I went to Haggai. Now I'm back in Ezra. And I'm only stopping at verse 2 in Ezra. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. Guys, you see what happened? Haggai preached. The work started back after 16 years, the word of God. Look at the sequence. I've done this little chart for you to follow. The work came to a halt. Haggai and Zechariah preached the word. We'll go back to Haggai again, Wednesday, God willing. Couple of, after Mother's Day, we'll, you know, we'll pause for Mother's Day. After Mother's Day, we'll come back, take a look at a couple of passages from Zechariah to get the context. But after the work stopped, Hagar and Zechariah preached, and the work started back. Brothers, sisters, friends, if ever we get sluggish in our spiritual lives, interact with God's word. Spend time in the scriptures. Yes, go to the men and women who are close to you, your mentoring times, your discipleship times, your one another times. Have those times, but go to God first. Consult his word. So by the time you get to those those one another times. You're able to share, look, this is what I studied. 
I want to share with you. Are there any other passages you can share to help me through this situation? Interact first with God's word. If you don't know how to read the Bible, there's a lot of help available to be able to show you how to read, how to understand. The word of God was preached. The hearts were moved. How do you respond to God's word? Here's a great challenge from the final chapter of the book of Isaiah. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? God is just too big. Even for you wants to contain him. Even the temple would just have been just a representation of God's presence. Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor. Pay attention to this. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. When God Almighty says, these are the people who I look on with favor, we pay attention to that. God says, I am pleased with these type of people. Those who are humble, those who are contrite in spirit, those who see God's word and tremble. God says, you see that kind of heart? I am pleased. God wants us to be humble people, contrite, broken. It's what Jesus started the Beatitudes with in Matthew 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He starts the Sermon on the Mount by saying those who are blessed, makarios, that Greek word, are those who are poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom, poverty of spirit. And understanding, I need God every day. Whether I think I'm doing well or not well, I need God. I am desperate for him. That poverty of spirit, that contrition, that humility before God, that pleases our Father. Don't worry about your behavior right now. Let us all focus on our heart and our spirit, being humble and contrite, understanding that we're broken vessels. We're not pointing out the sins of others around us, but we're looking at me. How do I need to change? How do I need to grow? And the person who is in my life, in my space, that's saying, I will pray for them and I will not focus on judging them. Let me change me first. It's one of the biggest decisions I've had to make, especially with my family. Don't focus on Michelle, Tyrell, and JT and their areas of growth. Pray for them. You know, one brother, one sister, just challenge me in, in, in private conversations. Pray, pray, pray. Always put your family in prayer. Go after it every day. I need to study to be an example and a gracious voice in my household that they feel free to be themselves and to make mistakes. Not because I'm going to judge them, but I'm praying for them. I'm humble and I understand I'm a broken vessel. And I need the grace of God every day. I want to be poor in spirit, humble in spirit, contrite in spirit. Even Jesus himself in Matthew 11 says, look, I'm gentle and humble in heart. Our Lord himself says he's gentle and humble in heart. If we're going to be his disciples, we have to be like him. We've got to tremble at God's word. God's word must never get stale. We must never have a hard heart when it comes to the word of God. Always trembling. You see, the same Isaiah had to challenge God's people. In, earlier in, in, in our chapter 29, it says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus quotes this in Matthew 7, in, in uh, Mark 7 and Matthew 15, quotes this very passage, looking at the fact that, my boy, religious people, sometimes we can be the ones who are furthest from God. We get steeped in our religious traditions. We don't even realize the traditions that we have. And we're thinking, hey, boy, we're close to God. I do this every day. I do this every week. I do this every month. And Jesus could say, but you're saying all of the right things. But your heart isn't close to me. You know, how, how are we really doing today? You know, be, before COVID, before we were forced to slow down, where was God's agenda in your life? 
And I ask the question, if life returns to quote unquote normal and your schedule gets busy again, are we going to be like the people at Haggai prophesied against and said, you know what? God's kingdom is not being built up, but we're taking care of ourselves. Long hours doing whatever it is of self-interest advancing our own lives. And advancing our lives has its place, but it cannot be to the detriment of God's agenda. Because what COVID has done, it has made us aware of our mortality and it has brought us face to face with the reality of death. We've got to have hearts that are close to God. I end this morning by reciting a poem that I heard during the course of this week. I was participating in an online seminar. Just one of the most beautiful pieces of literary work I've seen in a long time, done by a PhD student of theology by the name of Sarah Bonds. And some of you may have received it um, you know, during the course of the last couple of days. If you haven't, follow along with me if you have. Just reflect on these words again. Sarah Bones writes, and it's a poem called Exposed. We've all been exposed, not necessarily to the virus, though maybe, who knows? We've all been exposed by the virus. Corona's exposing us, exposing our weak sides, exposing our dark sides, exposing what normally lies far beneath the surface of our souls, hidden by the invisible masks we wear, now exposed by the paper masks we can't hide far enough behind. Corona is exposing our addiction to comfort, our obsession with control, our compulsion to hoard, our protection of self. Corona is peeling back our layers, tearing down our walls, Revealing our illusions, leveling our best laid plans. Corona is exposing the gods we worship, our health, our hurry, our sense of security, our favorite lives, lies, our secret lusts, our misplaced trust. Corona is calling into question, calling everything into question. What is the church without a building? What is my worth without an income? How do we plan without certainty? How do we love despite risk? Corona is exposing me, my mindless numbing, my endless scrolling, my careless words, my fragile nerves. We've all been exposed our junk laid bare, our fears made known, the band-aid torn, the masquerade done. So what now? What's left? Clean hands, clear eyes, tender hearts. What corona reveals, God can heal. Come, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Let's pray. Father, uh, we feel exposed by your word. Uh, we feel challenged by uh, the message of Ezra, Agai, Isaiah. And we, we thank you for uh, just reminding us that your agenda always comes first. Father, we pray for your forgiveness. We all, starting with me, have placed idols in our hearts. I'm too concerned with how I look and, and my image. I'm too concerned with financial stability and security. I'm too concerned with being able to know what the future holds. And I'm not concerned enough about just being spiritual, uh, connected to you and just living a life of just sacrifice, honoring you and just giving myself away, God, so you can use me. Father, forgive me. Help me to remove the idols in my heart so that I can worship you. I pray for us wherever we may at today, wherever we may be at in our journey, in uh, our walk with you, that you show us your grace. Uh, you remind us, God, of how deep and wide your grace is and 
you remind us that you are with us. Father, we, we feel exposed. We thank you just for the way that Ms. Bonds was able to articulate so poetically and so um, succinctly the way that even the virus has exposed us. We pray that you would be God of our hearts, that Jesus would truly be Lord, and we would follow him. We lift you up. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.